Um, Mr. Goy, can you first tell us about how can we protect content online and what role should different members of society play? I think uh, that it's very, very important to protect content online because we can't take advantage of this enormous power of new information and communication technologies unless we have something to share on it. And that means we have to find a means of rewarding creators, rewarding performers, uh, and rewarding, in other words, the content providers. Mm -hmm. uh, how do we do that? Uh, usually by protecting intellectual property, by protecting the copyright system. Uh, there are certain security measures that in addition one can uh, use. Uh, I think what is the different role of all the members of society, what we have to do here is ensure that everyone has a consciousness that what is at stake here really is the question of financing culture in the 21st century and in the digital environment. We all want books, we all want music, we all want films. Uh, and in order to get them, however, we have to be paying somehow mm. the creators. Okay. Working in the field of content uh, protection, uh, copyright protection, what challenges are you currently facing? Well, the biggest challenge is, of course, the, the uh, you know putting it in the broadest basis, mm. the in technological obsolescence of the legal model. Mm. The legal model that we had worked very well for the analog world, where you had a book or a, a CD or a DVD, which was a convenient. Uh, vehicle for collecting a royalty to return to the creators. Mm. Now in the containerless world of the internet we have a, a bigger difficulty and I think the world is still experimenting with various models that will work. Mm. Usually subscription models whereby they make available a whole library of content for a relatively small per unit mm. per, per capita mm. um, price. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think that ICT, with the booming use of ICT, can it reinforce content uh, protection, copyright protection, or it is uh, actually a threat to it? Well, I think we have to work together. I think the content providers have to work together with the technologists, those mm. who are providing, developing the information and communications technologies. Mm. It's very, very important to see this partnership uh, because it's in the interests of both. It's mm. in the interests of the co content providers mm. to have the the much greater distributional possibilities mm. that the new technologies provide mm. and it's also in the, introduced in the, in the interests of the, uh, those providing the ICTs, information communication technologies, to ensure that they have a very rich co uh, content to be mm. able to distribute. Mm -hmm. Okay, with pirated content uh, being downloadable for free for at most mm. of the time is usually cheap, cheap. So how can you address teenagers and get them to use copyrighted material and um, refrain, away, refrain away from uh, pirated? Well, I don't think you can compete with free. That's the problem. Mm. Uh, and for as long as it's free, there's no means of competing with that mm. and nothing is returned to the creators and the performers. Yeah. So this is not a model that works. Yeah. We have to pay for content. But mm. people are prepared to pay for content. You know, people pay subscriptions for television, mm. for different sorts of television services, mm. and they're used to that. I think it's just that we had an intervening period of 10 or 15 years in which music, for example, mm. was downloaded free. Mm. Uh, and we have to educate the public to, ensure, to a, a point where they understand that it is in their long-term interest to pay mm. uh, something to ensure a vibrant musical culture. Mm -hmm. In the panel, you mentioned that we need to achieve a balance between the incentivization of content creation and the diffusion of it. Can you highlight on this, please? Sure. Uh, I mean, I think that we've seen as a result of ICT, it's really a lowering of price of the availability of content, and that's very, very good. And that has been brought about in part because the audience is enlarged by so much, as now the whole world is the audience. Mm. Uh, and that enables us to, to lower the unit cost, mm. if you like. Uh, it's very important that content pr pr providers take advantage of that mm. because if they charge prices that are too high, we are going to see uh, a situation in which uh, there will be you destroying the incentive for people to participate mm. in payment yeah. of the creators. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, final question. How do you view content uh, protecting, protecting uh, copyright? In the, in, the, in the light of social media and social networking, which is really booming today, so how do you view this? Well, same problem. I mean, I think uh, subscription models are one way of doing it. Uh, mm. That's very, very important. Um, I think uh, making available content on, on, on terms that uh, reasonable and sure widespread diffusion is another way of doing it. Mm. Uh, I think I, I'm rather partial to the, to the notion that 
uh, libraries become available, but against payment. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. So, Mr. David, can you please first tell us about what is your definition of green ICT? What are the requirements for technology so that it can be green? Okay, well, I think you need to look at this in two separate aspects. The first is making sure that the carbon footprint, mm -hmm. the pollution that is actually produced as part of the manufacture and use mm -hmm. of the IC equipment, ICT equipment, is uh, minimized. Um, and the more and more of the uh, products that are in use, mm -hmm. obviously, unless the uh, average energy consumption and therefore pollution uh, of each product goes down, mm -hmm. the numbers are just going to keep um, adding up and up and up and up. Mm -hmm. uh, the second half is what ICT can do for other sectors. In other words, the way that uh, smart applications uh, of information technology, mm -hmm. of communications, and so forth can actually reduce yes. the pollution and the energy consumption of or a whole variety of other sectors from energy supply through to transportation. Yeah. Plenty of occasions where people have no particular need to consume as much energy as they do at the moment. Mm -hmm. And if they knew more about it or if they had smart systems which were available to them to control, they mm -hmm. would take that control. Mm -hmm. Okay. So mentioning carbon foot footprints, what can broadband, how can it be impacting carbon footprint and can it lessen, uh, yeah, can you just tell us more about that? Well, uh, the, the problem of course is that uh, effectively the broader the band, um, uh, the higher the energy use. Mm -hmm. um, that is not, uh, I'm glad to say, a fixed relationship um, mm -hmm. and uh, all sorts of impressive uh, achievements have been made uh, by the use of different equipment, by the use of different techniques, which has meant that actually the uh, the graph does not go up in quite the same uh, at the same rate mm -hmm. uh, as the um, the use of uh, broadband uh, would suggest. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, it's like running up a downward escalator. Uh, mm -hmm. You have to keep on finding ways of improving uh, the energy consumption. Um, through different techniques, through different pieces of hardware and the characteristics of different hardware, if you are going to make, if you're going to catch up with uh, the increases that would otherwise be used simply by essentially the development of the, and use of the product across mm -hmm. the world. Okay, so what role can governments play in encouraging the use uh, of green ICT? I think that governments firstly have to draw attention to the problem. Mm -hmm. um, it is uh, undeniable that ICT has the uh, capacity for providing a huge amount of assistance to attempts to deal with climate change and other environmental problems, yeah. but it has also to come clean about its own footprint. It has to um, understand, and governments have to remind it, mm -hmm. that this is an industry like many others with, which is very thirsty for energy, which is very thirsty for some materials uh, mm -hmm. in its footprint which have uh, environmental problems associated with it. Mm -hmm. And that means that um, government has to um, keep putting the pressure mm -hmm. on the companies so mm -hmm. that they understand that this is uh, a way in which they will be judged, judged by their customers, judged by uh, governments who could regulate if mm -hmm. they were not able to persuade, and judged by investors as well. Mm. And most importantly, from my perspective, I come from the International Emissions Trading Association, so I'm particularly interested in the impact, both as a stick and a carrot, that a price of carbon imposed mm. by government or governments can have. Once you have turned the thing that you actually want less of mm. into, if you like, a cost, a factor of production, then the normal economic reasons for trying to reduce that cost, reduce mm. the usage of that factor of production, come into play and we will benefit. Mm -hmm. So what incentives can be offered for individuals or businesses to engage in green ICT practices? Um, I think the price uh, alone will uh, provide an incentive, even mm -hmm. if it's only a rather negative incentive. Mm -hmm. But if it's a trading environment, then there's the possibility that a company can make enough savings to actually sell those savings to other people. Mm. Um, we're beginning to uh, see that approach through the European Emissions Trading Scheme. Uh, there will be others as well. Mm. What else can governments do? Governments can essentially approach um, uh, the uh, regulation uh, of uh, the use of appliances and products mm -hmm. um, 
of a, uh, a, a no longer acceptable um, rate of uh, energy consumption uh, and therefore with a uh, major carbon footprint. Mm -hmm. So you get an approach which has been used in a number of countries whereby essentially there is a constantly moving escalator, if you mm -hmm. like, of, of regulation. So that mm -hmm. the, the, the top 25% in terms of performance becomes the standard for the next generation mm -hmm. and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. That's the way that smart regulation ought to work to add to the price. Mm -hmm. So final question, green ICT for businesses, is it now a necessity or a competitive advantage possibly or a threat? I think it's all those things together. Mm. It's a necessity because, uh, frankly, it's a necessity not to waste money. And mm. if you can find ways of producing what you need at a lower cost, then you should be taking them. And while that may be rather a dispersed uh, sort of issue across many activities mm. in a business, if you've got a business which, for example, has a major footprint in terms of uh, use of, uh, of uh, ICT so that it's got its own a group of servers, for mm -hmm. example, well, you start looking uh, and it's sensible to identify the energy use mm -hmm. of that group of servers and start saying, what could we do to actually improve this? Mm -hmm. um, it's a threat mm -hmm. um, because if you don't get that right, then you are going to find that uh, the next guy, your competitor, uh, may have got hold of this idea quicker than you. Mm -hmm. um, and it's an opportunity because you can appeal to all the categories of stakeholders that I mentioned before, mm. your investors, your customers, your stakeholders more broadly, mm. by showing that you're a company which actually has a concern for the environment, has a concern for its own costs, mm. and is at the leading edge in terms of um, the overall profile of the industry. Mm. So, Mrs. Steinman, thank you so much for your time. And first, we'd like to know more about Converse, uh, what field it operates in, and what are your activities? With pleasure. Uh, so, Converse is a worldwide vendor of software and systems for value-added services, billing, and IP communications. We are active everywhere. We have over 500 customers, which are telecom service providers, fixed, mobile, cables, and any variation of these, um, all over the world, as I said. Uh, our systems count over 2 billion subscribers worldwide. Um, so we believe that we understand the notion of a service, the notion of a user, and we can envision best what would be the, the future communication experiences. Mm -hmm. Great. So the first question would be, do you believe that broadband can create new business activities? And if so, in what sense? So we hear for quite a while that content is king, and I think that now it's closer to truth because the handsets have such amazing uh, display with such great resolution and color depth. and the, if the promise of the broadband will deliver uh, for example over DSL 50 megabits to the home or the 4G and HSPA will deliver these great uh, paces that they promise then near high definition content will increase usage and will make the whole experience so much nicer because performance will be click mm -hmm. rather than and wait 10 seconds to mm. see something happening. Mm. Okay. Uh, what are the barriers, in your opinion, uh, are there to ICT and broadband adoption? Hmm. Okay, first, uh, there needs to be a, a very mature infrastructure that will guarantee really superb experience. Mm -hmm. If you remember, I mentioned before that mobile internet was introduced with WAP over GPRS in mm -hmm. 1995, mm -hmm. but the performance and experience were very disappointing. So first, we need the infrastructure in place in order to have a, an adequate experience. Mm -hmm. Second, I'd say that we need content, mm -hmm. but really there, there are so many types of content, professional content, TV content, mm -hmm. uh, user-generated content, which is really a huge trend. Mm -hmm. So this I'm less worried about. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, you mentioned also in your speech the, the importance of integration of web models. So right. can you highlight this uh, in detail? Uh, okay, first, um, I think that the wisdom of the crowds or the idea that uh, many experiences can go to many people as a long tail of experiences mm -hmm. preempts the ability uh, 
from the operator to be the sole provider of services. Mm. It means that many experiences will come from developers outside the operator. The mm. operators need to see, to think how they can deliver these services. Mm. Now operators will have to revenue share with developers mm. uh, services that will be downloaded, whether they will be a long tail or medium tail for enterprises, this we cannot anticipate. Mm. Because in the telecom environment, it's not that easy to develop an application and certify it and make sure that it doesn't corrupt the network and behance it mm. and, and uh, that everything works with the reliability and availability that the audience expects it to work. Mm. So there are difficulties, but thinking about the new models of rewarding developers, using viral marketing mm. and rewarding people who are um, proliferating service to other mm. to others is, is very important, and I think that we will see it happening very soon. Mm. So final question, you mentioned that to the era of silo MMS and SMS are gone, or will be going. So, can you highlight this and why you said that? I would like to correct myself and say that we are on the verge of a new era okay. where not only silo SMS and MMS will be usable, but also they will be used as a delivery mechanism for many, many other applications. Hmm. They will be the facilitator for many developments coming from the web, coming from uh, independent developers like we uh, just discussed. Hmm. And um, uh, maybe uh, if operators will allow open APIs to these facilities, many applications will use them and increase traffic and increase uh, um, revenues for all, all people involved. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Ms. Tate, thank you so much for taking the time to, for a quick interview. And first, we'd like to know, since this was the topic of the session today, uh, what is your definition of digital identity and how can we protect it? Well, obviously, as you know from today's uh, from today's uh, sessions on cybersecurity, that digital identity can be many, many different things to many different people, mm -hmm. and that's why, as we are talking at an international level about one, whose responsibility is it um, in terms of cybersecurity and protecting digital identity, um, and then also what are some of those standards and principles in order, whether it's at the government level. Level or all the way at the consumer, personal mm -hmm. level to protect our digital identity in mm -hmm. the digital age. Okay, so when dealing with the topic of cybersecurity, what approach should we take? Should we take a fear or a threat approach, or how can we deal with this subject? Right. Well, obviously, um, there are incredible opportunities that come with our connection to the Internet and to broadband. And so we certainly want to um, talk about all those possibilities from uh, distance learning to e-health to e-commerce. You know, absolutely, as we've heard, the ICT is having a huge impact positively during this economic downturn. Mm. So while we want to celebrate all the positive uh, uh, parts of this wonderful connectivity, we also do have to think about the risks and the dangers. Mm. Um, I am particularly concerned about those risks as they uh, apply to our children and youth. Mm -hmm. Are you with uh, being concerned about uh, malware detection tools and security uh, tools or educating people about the concept of cybersecurity first. Which should go first? And I think that these are all issues that we have to deal with hand in hand. As you know, we have many countries that are very sophisticated and have had years of experience with both the good parts of the internet and connectivity and also many of the dangers. And they may be farther ahead than many of the nations in many of the developing nations who are just now getting citizens connected. And so I think that all of this goes hand in hand. First of all, to your point, we have a whole new vocabulary of words that we have to deal with. And then, of course, we have to figure out what are the best solutions to try to solve those specific issues. And I also think, to your second point, it's extremely important that we begin to educate all of our citizens about cybersecurity, that this cannot be just a discussion for international leaders, but this needs to be a discussion for all of us, consumers everywhere in the world. Mm -hmm. I'm interested to know more about the Child Online Protection Act. Can you please highlight
highlight in detail what does it entail and what it, what does it call for? Yes, I'm very thrilled to have been part of the steering committee here mm -hmm. at the ITU, developing guidelines um, for educators, for parents, mm -hmm. for children and youth, and for the industry. Mm -hmm. um, these guidelines are trying to take the best of what has been developed all over the world based on research <laughs> and what is going on in other countries so that we can then share that information. You know, some nations are going to decide uh, to take different guidelines. Mm -hmm. um, in some nations, the private sector has stepped up, is, for instance, providing curriculum to every middle school student in the entire country. Mm -hmm. um, in some nations, I think that that is being done through government, either through law or regulation. So, for instance, having curriculum that may start at the kindergarten level and go all the way through high school. Mm -hmm. But I think it's important that we're not only teaching our children the skills, for instance, keyboarding or researching mm -hmm. on Online, but we're also teaching them about some of the real risk and dangers mm -hmm. that they can find in the online digital world. Mm -hmm. So my final question would be, in light of the booming uh, of Web 2.0 and social networking sites like Facebook and Twitter, how do you view children's safety online and cybersecurity uh, broadly? Well, of course, it's concerning both as a parent and mm. as a policymaker. Mm. Um, as our children become more and more digital, I, I had a quote the other day, a statistic from some research in the U.S. that our kids are um, consuming eight hours of media in six hours, which means that they're not just on one screen, they're on multiple screens. Mm -hmm. And so really, I think that there is a, a need for a larger dialogue about raising informed and good digital citizens mm -hmm. um, so that they can show good citizenship in the digital world just like they do in the real world. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for this interview. Mr. Kirk, thank you so much for taking the time for a short interview. And first, we'd like to know how you, how you see the global strategy for telecos. How, is it, how important is it uh, in the meantime? I think a telecommunications provider can't succeed. Uh, unless they're being very local in their marketplace. You have to understand what people want, what drives their needs, how their societies are developing, how their workplace is developing, how their families are communicating and so forth. So you absolutely have to be local. But in being local, you need to bring to your customers in the marketplace the benefits that you can achieve through global scale and through global connectivity, because many people have family, have friends, have contacts, who live in different parts of the world, they want to be in touch with them, they want to be communicating with them. Mm -hmm. We need to be providing them with that platform as well. Mm -hmm. How do you think local talent is important for a teleco that is aiming to enter a new local market? Well, I don't think you can understand a local market if you are not local. Um, so getting local talent into your operations as fast as possible is hugely important. Mm -hmm. At the same time, and we've just had this experience in Qatar starting our our new company there, um, you need the expertise of managing a telecommunications company and if you're going to be part of a larger group as Vodafone in Qatar is, uh, you need also to understand the operating systems of that larger group, you need to benefit from the technological expertise and so forth. So as you start it should be a mix of uh, the talent that you bring in from outside and the talent that you uh, bring into the company inside the country. Um, as you develop in the country, you should be bringing on the local talent, and that's hugely important. So we see ourselves having a professional development function, uh, which is critical. But it's not confined to a country like Qatar, so we would hope that the best people we're recruiting in Qatar into the company wouldn't see their future only in Vodafone Qatar, but they would see their future in Vodafone. Mm -hmm. So final question, how do you think com consumers' communication needs are changing or, or evolving uh, currently? I think they're evolving very fast, um, and they're evolving in all sorts of different ways. Um, and that's part of the beauty of what's happening in telecommunications now. You used to have a rather defined set of services, voice, text, and so forth. Now you're starting to see all sorts of social media, different forms of content, different ways of interacting coming into the industry. Um, and that's opening all sorts of new potential. And I think our job as service providers is to make sure that our customers can benefit to the maximum extent that they want to. Mr. Erickson, thank you so much for your time. And we'd like first to ask you about how do you view the conversions of CT and IT and what it means for consumers? 
I think in general it will be more and more difficult to decide what is uh, telecommunication and what is sort of pure uh, uh, internet. And that's, this, these are merging and I think the important thing is to make sure that you put the end user in focus and make sure to come up with a good solution that the end user is willing to, to pay for to the extent that you can continue providing the solution. Mm -hmm. uh, green ICT and how ICT can in, uh, respond to climate change is a very booming topic nowadays. So how do you view green ICT? Is it an opportunity or threat uh, to telecoms? Absolutely an, an, an opportunity because the, the whole ICT sector only contributes about 2% to the man-made carbon dioxide in the world. Mm -hmm. And then there's a of course we have to make sure that we reduce our portion, our 2% and work very hard with that so that we sort of walk the talk and become credible. But mm. then there is also the whole 98% where we can help in reducing the carbon dioxide footprint by using ICT in a clever way. And mm. there are many different studies down there, but somewhere in the range of 15 to 20% out of the 98% can be reduced by using ICT the right way. Mm. So if you look at it, we have 2% over here that can reduce 20% over here. That's sort of a 10 to 1 payback. Mm -hmm. of, of using ICT, so definitely it's an opportunity and I think really as we go forward now for the COP15 and so on, we should look to the ICT sector and see that we invite also the sector that can be part of solving the problem mm -hmm. to the table. Mm -hmm. uh, cloud computing is a very important topic nowadays. How do you think it has an impact on carbon emissions? That is one, one solution of, of many, because the carbon emission will have to work with how to reduce power consumption uh, and make it more as, as uh, effective as possible. And if, if the cloud computing is part of that, then of course it's part of the total solution. Mm -hmm. Finally, how do you envision the telecom industry in the coming 10 years? We will see more and more broadband. If, uh, we, I think we have only seen the beginning of broadband, and as broadband now goes mobile, if you look at it, today we have 4 billion mobile users and 1 billion fixed users. Mm -hmm. And if you look ahead five years, we will have 4 billion mobile broadband users and 1 billion fixed broadband users, to mm -hmm. the extent we can still separate what is fixed and mobile at the time. So mm -hmm. we've only seen the beginning of a broadband explosion. Mm -hmm. Mr. Satamore, thank you so much for giving us uh, the opportunity to interview for a short interview. And first, we'd like to know about ISOC, what it is and what its activities. So the Internet Society was founded in 1992 by two of the fathers of the Internet, Ben Cerf and Bob Kahn. And we are, our, our primary mission is to support the open development, evolution and use of the Internet for the benefit of people throughout the world. Mm -hmm. We do that largely through activities in the areas of technology, policy and development. Mm -hmm. And um, for many years, in fact, have, have um, held a number of events, workshops, training courses, etc. to help developing countries actually build their own internet capability. Mm -hmm. uh, with the U.S. government withdrawing its uh, control over ICANN, what's your take on this? No, we're very happy to do that. It's something we've actually encouraged them to do and in fact have supported um, for some time now. Mm -hmm. um, the original model for ICANN was a private sector-led, multi-stakeholder organization. Mm -hmm. And um, I think it was appropriate that the U.S. government, for the first few years of its life, provided some additional oversight. Mm -hmm. It was a new institution, a new model. Mm -hmm. That support was very helpful. But we're exceedingly happy that they've actually lived up to their original commitments in, in the 1998 white paper. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you think the future Internet will look like? Um, I actually hope it looks um, largely like today in terms of users having the ability to create, to develop, to choose the applications that meet their needs. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, one of the things we're quite concerned about that under the guise of better protecting uh, users or, or better serving their interests, mm -hmm. that we start to restrict um, the ability of users, again, to choose or create their own applications. Mm -hmm. Are you with or against changing the structure, the current structure of the Internet? Um, certainly not against it. I, I just don't think it's actually um, an appropriate path today. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there are, we'll have the current internet with us for decades and decades. There are applications and services deployed today that we all will continue to, to depend on. Um, there are many new internet-like networks coming up. Uh, mm -hmm. Sensor nets, a network of things. Um, and our, our strong desire is that those networks actually interoperate with the current internet and mm -hmm. that we ensure that we have a globally um, addressable, um, interoperable internet. Mm -hmm. Final question, how do you think Web 2.0 and social networking will change the future of the internet? Um, 
change the future of the internet or change the, the future of, of um, society, I guess. Um, you know, I know for a while when uh, technology was developing, people were sort of bemoaning the fact that we moved away from physical interaction mm -hmm. and some concern that we'd come to an electronic world. Mm -hmm. And I think we've almost come full circle in a sense with, with um, things like Twitter, uh, where people can now, on a, on a very international basis, very global basis, mm -hmm. um, actually hear from other like interested parties and frankly those that have different different views. So in mm -hmm. fact, I think we've created a very international community that they can easily share share their interests. Mm -hmm. um, so we're you know very very supportive again of developments. Nobody would have assumed that Twitter would in fact get mm -hmm. the following it, it had. Mm -hmm. And um, it, one of the things that we're actually very interested in in the Twitter model is Twitter is actually built on an open platform mm. and the ability that users that have to actually adapt that platform by putting the hashtag mm -hmm. facility in, which allows as a convention for actually grouping topics, mm. um, the at, si at sign um, mm. to support replies. Those were all user developed and deployed on Twitter. They did not come from, you know, from the organization yeah. Twitter. So I think that's just further um, sort of proof of the, the viability and uh, scalability of the open internet. Mm-hmm.